Okay, welcome back to another episode of The Andrew Giuliani Show. And this is the election week special. Yeah, I wish I could say election day, but as we know, it's election week or really election week and a half. And with election day approaching and election week already upon us, I want to cover three of the tightest races here in the city of New York, along with the two ballot proposals. That way you, the voter, can be really educated as we do a deep dive into these races. The first race I want to talk about is District 19, which is in Northeast Queens, includes Whitestone, College Point. The incumbent is Vicki Palladino, who is a very close friend of mine, going against Tony Avella. Now, Vicki uh, has been an outspoken conservative. She has been a fighter for her district. Uh, most recently, she was instrumental in closing St. Agnes as a migrant shelter uh, in College Point, which the community did not want. Uh, City Hall tried to put that in at the 11th hour, at midnight, I should say, and Vicki was instrumental in doing that and actually worked with the mayor's office in order to get that done from her minority role in the city council. Um, this is a rematch of the 2021 city council race where Vicki won by a few hundred votes. It was a very close race. Uh, took a few days to actually call this, but Vicki ended up knocking out Tony Avella, who had served for 16 years between the state Senate and the city council of New York. Now, a couple of important issues going into this that I really want to cover, and I think it's important that we really kind of talk about the issues of the day going into these to see how voters will actually focus in. So last week, uh, Tony Avella had a supporter of his host a fundraiser for him. No surprise, right? That's what happens. That's what happened to me as a candidate, right? Different supporters would host, especially as you got closer to Election Day. That way you'd have the money to be able to spend it on advertising, like on WABC radio, on television, or wherever. The problem with this was the person who hosted the fundraiser for Tony Avella is a Hamas sympathizer put his information all on Facebook. Uh, I'll tell you exactly what this person on Facebook ended up writing. This guy's name is, last name is Anwar, Chaudhry Anwar. And uh, on October 9th, on one post, so two days after the uh, violence, the uh, massacre in Israel, uh, Mr. Anwar ended up posting, long live Islam, long, long live Islam, long live Jihad. That was October 19th. Then, sorry, that was October 9th. Long live Islam, long live Jihad. Then, on October 19th, he posted a 1935 speech from Hitler uh, along with photos of the Fuhrer alongside hearts and a flag of Palestine, a Palestinian flag. Um, he also said in another post, God is the greatest the Palestinian Mujahideen inside of Israel. So this is a guy who was obviously celebrating the massacre inside of Israel, the raping of women, the beheading of babies, uh, the torturing of civilians, uh, and celebrating this. Now, what Mr. Avella ended up saying when uh, this became obvious to the press outside was that his social media ended up getting hacked. Mr. Anwar's Social media ended up getting hacked. Uh, I've never known Mr. Anwar. I've known him for many years. I've, he has never professed any anti-Semitic views. Uh, and Anwar insists that his Facebook page was hacked and he did not make any of these terrible posts. Now, look, that would be tough for me to buy in any scenario. Uh, let's say, though, for instances, your Facebook or your social media did get hacked. Uh, you might have something that would post over the course of minutes or even hours. Uh, maybe, maybe if you weren't paying attention more than a day. But these posts occurred over the course of 10 days. Think about that. I mentioned October 9th. He said, long live Islam, long live Jihad. And then October 19th, he ended up posting a 1935 speech from Hitler. I'm sorry. I cannot buy in any kind of way that your social media got hacked if it's been going over the course of 10 days. And it's not like you deleted the October 9th post, let's say on October 12th or 13th, when you found out, and then all of a sudden it got hacked again and a new thing came out. 
This stuff stayed up there. So there's nobody of reasonable mind that can actually believe that his information did get hacked and that th this was on there. It's just not viable, not believable, which leads me to conclude that, yes, it's obvious that Tony Avella attended a fundraiser hosted for him by ha a Hamas sympathizer who believes that they should long live Islam, long live jihad on October 9th after this torture to Israel and who would post a speech from Hitler. It is kind of amazing when you think about that, considering the light of what has happened. Uh, this is something the Paladino campaign I know is and should be on and should continue to tell not just all the Jewish New Yorkers that live in District 19, but all New Yorkers who live in District 19 and around the city and around the state factually. Because the truth is, this is something that's just not tolerable. There's no way in the world that you should be celebrating what happened to these innocent, innocent civilians, these babies, these women in Israel. And to do this uh, with what just happened so recently, with an election coming up in less than a month, and you're going to be hosting the candidate, eh, no shame whatsoever. Completely disgusting. There's... I would say close to zero way in the world that this was an actual hack when it occurred over nine days. Just not possible. Another thing about Mr. Avella, which I think is very important to point out, which was as state senator, he led the push to decriminalize hypodermic needles, which, look, they talk about how this is making sure that uh, people who are addicted do not go to jail. But the truth is, we know what this is. This is normalizing drug abuse. And this has allowed drug abuse to now happen on trains. I've seen this happen on the subway. It allows it to happen where kids are being pushed on the stroller. It's just not acceptable at all. And Mr. Avella was one of the leaders in the state Senate of doing that. He needs to be, a, he needs to be held to account for that at a time when we're looking at our public safety in New York City and seeing the disaster that it's turning into, uh, Mr. Avella, frankly, has contributed to that in his, with his time as an elected official. And that's why I believe he does not deserve your vote if you are making the choice to potentially vote for him. A couple things about Vicky Palladino that I want to particularly highlight. You know, last year, uh, Councilwoman Palladino was stripped of her committee assignments uh, because she had the audacity to say, that she believed that Drag Queen Story Hour was inappropriate for our children. Well, guess what? You know, the progressive, the leftist caucus in the city council, they said, oh my God, this is terrible. How could she do this? She's anti-LGBTQ. No, she's not. What she said was exactly what the majority of New Yorkers, left or right, are actually thinking. It's not appropriate for kids in schools to be confronted with their sexuality at such a young age, to be confronted with drag queens. And you have a city council that spoke up more about that, about what Mrs. Palladino, what Councilwoman Palladino said about drag queen story hour and how it relates to our children in schools than they would stand and defend with Israel. It is amazing, but it is not unbelievable anymore. Vicky Palladino was the one who had the guts to stand up even other Republicans in the council didn't have the guts at the time to actually stand up and say what New Yorkers believed. Say what many New Yorkers might have believed but didn't have the guts to stand up and say. It's why I've called Vicky Palladino the most dynamic elected official in the city of New York. And it's why it is so important that you reelect Vicky Palladino for city council. That is my belief. That is Andrew Giuliani speaking. Not WABC, I want to be very clear. but. I'm a believer that if we're going to get this city right again, that we need leaders that are going to have the courage to get up there and stand up. Vicky Palladino has been painted uh, by the left as a radical, but the truth is Vicky Palladino is a fighter and a warrior and somebody that has the guts to, to, to speak truth to power. And that's why I stand with Vicky Palladino in this race against Tony Avella. Okay, on to District 13. We go right across the Whitestone Throgs Neck Bridge, if you will, uh, to a race between the incumbent, 
Democrat Marjorie Velasquez and Christy Marmorado. Now, this was a very close primary uh, for Christy Marmorado on the Republican side. It was a heated primary. Um, I know Curtis was uh, for a different candidate. Uh, And uh, I actually ended up interviewing earlier on the podcast, earlier in the spring, uh, all three of the Republican candidates that ended up running. Uh, Christie won, I think, by about 100 votes or so. Might have been just a little less than 100 votes. Uh, Marjorie Velasquez is the incumbent in this race. A couple of numbers to give you an idea of how close this district actually is. Uh, Even though it's a 61% Democratic district, so 61% Democrats, you think this would be a a blue district. The truth is, in the last two races, Curtis Sliwa ended up winning this by just over 1% over Eric Adams. Uh, And Kathy Hochul ended up beating uh, Congressman Zeldin by about 5%, a little more than 5% in this district. So both times, this has been within 6%. Curtis Lee were even winning this district uh, in 2021 for the mayoral race. Um, I think one of the big issues here, a little background about the two of them, Marjorie Velasquez, uh, like I said, is the incumbent, Christy Marmorado. She is an x-ray technician, somebody who has ties to the Republican Party in the Bronx, somebody who has uh, had success in private business, and I think in many times, uh, some of the best, uh, most successful people in politics creating policy, let's say, are those that actually have experience in the private sector and not necessarily in the public sector. Um, Obviously, public safety, like it is all around the city, is going to be a major issue, but one issue in particular in this race is going to be development. Uh, Marjorie Marjorie Velasquez, during her 2021 campaign, uh, said that she would uh, fight against the Bruckner rezoning rezoning plan. And that was one of the reasons why she got elected in a race where I think she only got elected by about 10, 12 points. It was relatively close. even uh, and I think there wasn't even that many resources poured behind the Republican candidate there. I remember going up and seeing him uh, maybe during a Columbus Day parade up there, and uh, I think the party didn't really pour any money or any support behind him. I think the the campaign was kind of uh, just uh, you know kind of just a couple of people basically uh, running and volunteering on it. Um, but the Republican Party sees an opportunity for a pickup here, and one of the big issues is the Bruckner rezoning because as I mentioned. Marjorie Velasquez said that she would fight against this rezoning. Uh, It's one of those beautiful areas in New York City that's unique. You know, New York City obviously has so many tall buildings and skyscrapers and apartments. Um, But there are some amazing, wonderful areas that are residential and feel suburban. Uh, The Southeast Bronx is one of those areas. If you think of Throgs Neck in that area, it it really is wonderful. And it's a place that... uh, so many of the residents want to keep residential and they do not want to uh, add these uh, bigger buildings and skyscrapers uh, there as well. So uh, basically what Velasquez ended up doing, even though she campaigned saying she would end up fighting against this Bruckner rezoning, as she was elected, she ended up flipping and selling out uh, and supporting the Bruckner rezoning plan. Uh, It turned off many of the people, Republican, Democrat, who had supported Marjorie Velasquez. And this is why I think this is going to be one of the closest races coming down to election day. Um, I think this race is going to be a 3% race either way. Uh, if Christy Marmorado ends up winning, then she wins by three points or less. If Velasquez wins, I think it's the same thing. She wins by three points or less. So every single vote in that race ends up counting. Uh, I think Marmorado, while Velasquez has tried to appear to be more of a common sense Democrat, you could see kind of earlier on that she was kind of flirting with the defund the police faction. She has been careful not to Uh, go with that faction. She's actually kind of uh, poo-pooed some of the progressives in that district. But there has been uh, a very clear, distinct, uh, Christy Marmorado is absolutely for funding the police fully, is against bail reform, is against some of these uh, drastic policies for our police's qualified immunity, against so many of these drastic policies that have seen New York crime skyrocket over the last four or five years. Um, I think Christy Marmorado would make uh, a very good city council member and uh, another 
I think another person who has not spent a career in government, uh, in politics, is probably a good thing. And uh, you know what? For somebody who was in the healthcare field, considering everything that had gone through over the last four years, uh, if they could face those challenges, they may even be able to face New York City political challenges as well. That's District 13 in the Bronx. Okay, another one which has gotten plenty, plenty of interest recently is the District 47 race in Brooklyn. And by the way, there are about four or five other races that I think are going to be very close. There are a couple more in Queens, uh, one or two others in Brooklyn, the majority Asian American district in Brooklyn, which is a three-way race. I think that's going to be a fascinating race that's going to be very close. We'll see if the Republican and conservative candidates don't end up uh, taking votes away from each other and sadly electing the Democrat. You still could see either one of them winning on that. Uh, but the other one I want to focus on before we end up getting into the ballot proposals is D District 47 uh, in southern Brooklyn. You know, Bay Ridge, Coney Island, Seagate. Uh, this is fascinating because you actually have two incumbents here because of the redistricting. You have uh, incumbent Justin Brennan, who uh, last race in 2021, I think might have won the closest of all the city council races in 2021, barely defeating uh, Brian Cox against another incumbent, Eric Ari Kagan, who is now a Republican conservative. He switched over from being a Democrat earlier this year to being a Republican. Uh, and basically, because of the redistricting, they are each taking pieces of their district, which is forming the new district there. So they technically are both the incumbents on this. Uh, the breakdown for what it's worth, I don't think in this race it really matters quite as much, uh, but it's 55% Democrat uh, here. Uh, you have 17% Republican, 24% unaffiliated. You could see that a lot of Democrats uh, and most of the unaffiliated end up going with the Republicans in the 2021 mayoral race. Curtis Sliwa won this with uh, by about a half a percent over Eric Adams. So it's going to be very close. You look at how much Sliwa ended up winning this by, uh, and then you look at how close Brennan's district was in 2021, which is obviously a little bit of a different district, but uh, the majority of it is in this new district where he only won by, I think, a few dozen votes. Uh, this is going to be a really, really close race. Uh, they've each raised an equal amount of money uh, on hand here. And look, here's the thing about Kagan, right? He, he supported Kathy Hochul. Uh, he is a new Republican. And so you could have some of the tried and true conservatives and Republicans, like myself at first. I asked about Ari Kagan. I said, well, look. Is this guy a real Republican? Is he a true Republican? This guy was a Democratic district leader for years. Um, and I thought about this a little bit deeper. And I'm not sure if he necessarily is. I think this will be a time will tell kind of a situation. But this is a guy who was born in Belarus, born in the Soviet Union. Uh, originally, as a youngster, was, uh, was exposed to uh, communist politics, right? Soviet politics. Uh, and uh, because of that, ended up coming over to the United States of America, decided to get involved in the Democratic Party because, uh, well, decided to get involved in politics because he wanted to fight for I, what I believe is freedom, right? I believe he cherished his freedoms. I think he might have seen now over the course of the last decade plus that those freedoms are not necessarily what the Democratic Party stands for, seeing it over COVID. Maybe not. Maybe he hasn't. Maybe I'm completely wrong on this, but I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt considering what he has said. Um, and even if I am wrong about this, and let's say Kagan is not the tried and true Republican that he is saying that he is for campaigning purposes, he's at least a guy who will vote with the Republicans on most of these issues. What we know is, and maybe this is one of these races where you look and you say it's kind of a process of elimination race. Look, you're not always going to get the candidate that you're in love with in this, right? For me, the candidate I love, I love Vicky Paladino. That's easy, right? Vicky's a very easy one for me to look at and say, you know what? She's going to go out there and fight for my daughter. She's going to fight for your kids. She's going to fight for our public safety. That's easy. This one it takes a little bit more time to dig into this, but I think when you dig into this, you just have to go to what Brennan ended up saying about defunding the police in 2021, 
when this was hot, when this was popular, before any of the races that really cost some of the Democrats in New York, and they started looking and saying, maybe defund the police is not necessarily the right idea. So in 2021, when, uh, def- when the defunding of the police, when the budget cuts of the police ended up passing, uh, Mr. Brennan, who, by the way, if those who remember, he was kind of the heir apparent to be the city council speaker. If he was not in such a tight and close race, if that race would have been a five or a 10 point race, even, then I think Brennan might have been the city council speaker. But because it was such a tight and close race, uh, Brennan had to focus on his new district, uh, the Democrats did not want somebody who was prone to losing a re-election to actually get that speaker's case, and I think he lost some political capital, and he did not become the city council speaker. But in 2021, uh, he said to his allies in the Democratic caucus uh, of the city council, after the budget cuts, which was the defund the police budget cuts, quote, I understand many feel that these police cuts Do not go far enough, but the work does not stop tonight. So this is not a guy who was voicing the, hey, we cut the police's budget here. We've already seen crime starting to tick up. This could be a problem. We might not want, we might want to stop and think about this. No, Brennan's instinct was immediately to go and say, you know what? This is just the first step at cutting the policed budget. That's where Brennan stands on this. That's where his instinct is on this. And that's why I think he's a real problem. And like I said, Kagan's a new Republican. I can't tell you that he's going to, he shares those same conservative values that I do. Um, But I do think he'll be, I do know he'll be a more reliable vote for conservative causes, for public safety causes, um, for pro-freedom causes. I believe that. I believe that he's a guy that does look at the freedoms that uh, have been taken away in this country over the last years. And I think maybe he's reassessed and said, you know what? Uh, I am pro-freedom. So that's why I think Kagan is a better choice than Justin Brennan. And like I said, a district that is going to be very, very close. In 2021, this is extremely close. Curtis pulled this district out by less than half a point. When Brennan won it, he won it by less than half a point. It is a really, really tight race. Okay, so now I want to get to, when you turn over that ballot, if you haven't voted already, you're going to get two budget proposals, and they are to remove constitutional debt limits. Let's take a couple of minutes to go through them. Now, this is where the real wonk stuff goes in. Not to say that I'm a policy wonk, but, uh, you know, I think it's very important that we are educated as a uh, citizenry. And uh, let's take a couple of minutes to actually go through what these two ballot proposals end up saying. There are two amendments to the state constitution, which will, the first one, remove, it's called the removal of small city school districts from special constitutional debt limitation. Let me just read a little brief synopsis of what this would do. This constitutional amendment removes the special debt limit for small city school districts. Debt limits would be established in state law for all school districts. A small city school district is one that includes at least part of a small city. A small city is a city with with less than 125,000 people. The state constitution limits how much debt a small city school district can incur. Their debt cannot be more than 5% of the value of taxable real estate in the district. That's important. There are exceptions for certain expenses. Other school districts are not subject to a constitutional debt restriction, but have a certain debt limit provided by state law. That's probably a good thing that a debt limit is provided by state law. State law says their debts cannot be greater than 10% of the value of taxable real property. If this constitutional amendment passes, small city school districts would would be eligible to have uh, debt limits basically thrown out here. This says the same debt limits as other school districts enacted via via legislative action. To me, this is, uh, in my opinion, a no. Look, I know this is saying that, hey, look, we can um, we can basically make this consistent. So you can make an argument for the consistency on this, right? Having the same debt limit as other school districts enacted via legislative action. But remember, when you're talking about smaller city school districts, um, there are less 
expenses that a smaller city needs to occur rather than, let's say, the city of New York or even New York's big second biggest city, Rochester, uh, Buffalo, Rochester, um, Syracuse. Um, to me, I think uh, it's important to make sure that you keep these debt limits on and that if they are to actually um, remove or I should say increase the debt limitations, that it actually ends up going through a process here on a line-by-line -line basis. It's just another way to add more debt to the counties, more debt to the state, more debt to the cities. Uh, so for me, uh, I'm, a, I'm a no on this. Uh, I think, again, this is more of kicking the can down the road for our kids. Again, you can make the argument that uh, it kind of... Um, that it would uh, make this consistent with other ones. But I, I think uh, any time that you end up adding to the state, uh, adding to the budget in this way, um, I, don't think, I don't think it's necessarily a good idea. And especially when you see kind of uh, what so many of our public schools in New York have been using some of that money for. That also makes me think, you know what? I think we should be cutting. I don't think we should necessarily be uh, increasing the debt limit on this. Okay, second one is also a uh, debt exclusion, basically, uh, proposal. So this is proposal number two. When you turn over the ballot, you'll see extending sewage project debt exclusion from the debt limit. Uh, basically, uh, to go through this, the Constitution limits the debt counties, city, towns, and villages can incur. That's a good thing. There's a reason why they limit the debt that our counties, our cities, and our towns and villages can take on, right? Just like any business, you wouldn't just say, let's take on debt, uh, you know, an, an inordinate amount of debt, an uh, infinite amount of debt. This debt limit does not include debt for sewage treatment and disposal construction project. The sewer debt exception expires on January 1st, 2024. This amendment extends the sewer debt exception for 10 more years until January 1st, 2023. Uh, to me, this is another no on this one. I think it's no on both of them. This is about adding more debt to a state budget, frankly, that, uh, that has budget shortfalls, big budget shortfalls. And when you look at the fact that New York State's debt uh, uh, budget is $235 billion now, um, it's massively increased just over the last five years. It was uh, just, I believe, in 20, I'm going off the, my mind on this one, in 2017, I want to say $170 billion. Now we're over $230 billion. Um, and it's one of the reasons why so many New Yorkers are moving out because they're looking and saying, oh, more taxes, more problems here. So look, again, election week is upon us. Get out there and vote. I urge you to vote early if you can. Please do that. I'll be voting this weekend before Election Day. So important to make sure we get out there and support our candidates, support a smaller budget. Um, like I said, get out there and vote for your candidates. Make your voice heard. Uh, and uh, I have to believe that we are one year away from the presidential election of 2024. We will have a lot to talk about over the next year about that. But in the meantime, get out there and vote for your city council candidates. I'm Andrew Giuliani. I will see you next week, ladies and gentlemen.